Imagine a character who is dying. You do not have to imagine that character. You are this character. And the truth is, so am I. The truth is, the wound bleeds strong and defiant, in spite of my violent efforts for it to cease. Death creeps in this petty pace from day to day. A maple watches over me from somewhere in my remembered past. It's leaking too, for the maple has been stabbed, just so that others can see and taste the sweet nectar of the beautiful tree. Just so that others could taste the fruit of their work that they've robbed from this poor maple that watches over me. My soul is carried, baked, and incubated, ready for whatever dice world paradise or hell awaits. The maple does not await anything. The maple is not afraid of any mortal or immortal threat. It is a virgin unto this world. The maple is not afraid of fate, not worried of Burnham Wood, not worried of Dunstane Hill. The maple is not afraid of the coming death. Out, out, brief candle. The maple dives into the waters chaotic, the unrelenting unknown beneath the surface. It is not afraid. Shan't I be afraid? None of this damned fear, this drawn out stress and forced fear. It is a tale told by an idiot. What I hope this poem illustrates is two main responses you can have in the face of disruption. On one hand, you have the narrator, who at their meek, weakest, most vulnerable, decides to search instead of giving up. In this most futile last effort, they decide to yearn. On the other hand, you have the maple, which comes to represent what it is to be unchanging, unafraid. It doesn't matter if we're ninth, it doesn't matter if we're Scottish kings or ninth grade basketball players or even office workers. In the face of disruption, we must play both parts. We are the maple and the narrator. For example, who doesn't sift through the past trying to find the tropes that center us, that remind us who we are? I got pretty interested in this idea, in the relationship between self and disruption. I started by asking questions about the self, whether it was based on your voice, your appearance, all the cells in your body. But the thing is, somebody may not recognize you by these attributes, and they, like everything, are always changing. Now, what is narrow-minded or naive about these problems is we're looking at the self from our perspective. We're looking at the concept from the inside out. To understand the true definition of self, we need to look at how our physiology interacts with the universe around us. The first lead I got on this idea was in looking at this Im image published by Dr. Arlene R. Taylor, a leading speaker on, uh, on brain function. It's an image of a PET scan from a trained musician and a non-trained musician. Now what's interesting and it is it shows three entirely different parts of the brain being active, reacting to the exact same music. Those parts being the frontal lobe, different regions of the temporal lobe, and auditory cortex. This is what showed me that yourself is not what makes up its current shape, it's what shaped it in the first place. I wouldn't have found this definition of self without music. In my life, one area where experience has affected me differently than most is in studying the golden ratio polyrhythm. Now, the golden ratio polyrhythm is 100% impossible to perform the entirety of, but I still played a segment of it about 20 seconds long. And it was very difficult, and I couldn't, very, I couldn't quite get it right, but one thing interesting happened right after I studied it. I would be listening to certain things differently. I'd be listening to one of the biggest differences, rain. I'd be listening to the rain, and I'd hear the golden ratio in it which made absolutely no sense because it had to be impossible, but this happens with many other things in life. It's a great example of cognitive pattern recognition, where your mind sees something everywhere it goes and it latches onto it. Okay, now that I've talked about my experience with polyrhythms, <laughs> I'd like to show you a few polyrhythms so that you too can disrupt the noise that disrupts you. So, one of, if not the most easy polyrhythms that you can do is the 2-3 polyrhythm. Now, the 2-3 polyrhythm is essentially a synchronized note followed by a triplet. Now, I'm going to have everybody do a synchronized note in a soon time. Just in case you didn't know, that's whenever you hit both your hands at the same time. So, that's going to sound like this. Okay, we're going to do that in 3, 2, 1. Easy. So next we're going to do a triplet. So a triplet is exactly what it sounds like. It's one, two, three, triplet, back and forth. So the whole polyrhythm all together will sound like this very even. So I'm going to set the pace here, and then I'm going to have all of you join in with synchronized triplet. So 
here's the pace. Okay. That was great. We all got it immediately. That's awesome. So what we're going to move on to now is the 3-4 polyrhythm, which is the first introduction of not syn uh, synchronization, but syncopation. So syncopation is whenever you have a consistent rhythm. I'm just going to demonstrate this one. No need to follow along. So if I had four going on my, left, my right hand, and then I paused for a second, and then I came back right to the same beat, that would be syncopation. So the 3-4 polyrhythm is going to sound like this. I'm going to have all of you tap four with your right hand, and then I'm going to slowly add in the left hand, and you're going to try and do the same. So three, two, one, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, everybody keep this going. I'm going to add my left hand very slowly. Try to keep your right hand consistent. Okay, keep going, keep going. All right, now you try and add your left hand. So that was great. That was a great example of uh, that was a great example of chaos, and that is an example of how you are all disruptors. You all disrupted what we were doing. I told you what it was, but you just couldn't do it. <laughs> this is why everyone is a disruptor, just as surely as, as they are disrupted. Originally, I showed you the two three, and you followed along. I disrupted you, and then for the two, three four. You all did it, and it threw everybody off. So now that I've explained that, I'm going to jump right back to the golden ratio polyrhythm. So the golden ratio polyrhythm is very hard to explain, given the examples that I've given you for polyrhythms in general. From what you know, it's two different rhythms, and those two match up in a unique way to make a polyrhythm. Polyrhythm meaning multiple rhythms, poly meaning many, and rhythmic, well, rhythmic. So. Basically, the golden ratio polyrhythm consists of the golden ratio se sequence, which is 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, and so on forever. So that pattern is adding the previous to the next, so that would be 0 plus 1 is uh, 1, and then 1 plus 1 is 2 for the rest of the pattern. Now what's interesting is these points do not represent what your hands are doing. They represent the points that sync up. That's the important part. So the polyrhythm never repeats. It is always changing, and it always has a different sync-up point, different distances apart, further and further away. OK, now that I've talked about all of that, I'd like to give you a little bit of my uniqueness, my disruption, my maple that I've gained from all this research in my favorite form. All these hours, I've searched and yearned for a vital clue some revelation hidden in the dark, but I sit in denial of my strange brew, a brew of knowledge, of curiosity, of determination. But through all this searching, this yearning, I'm learning something new. My head is throbbing, but oh, it's so exciting to see my finished and strange brew. In search for something perfect, looking in patterns and water dripping, some greater effect in the huge light of the world ticking, I have found something new. Not something pretty, nothing shiny, not something I've been looking for, nothing hiding, but something plain to see. As stupid as it sounds, ideas piled in mounds, my desire lies in the observation. My desire for an organized, concise realization was a contradiction to what I was searching for. I was, some, I was searching for some amazing eureka, one big conclusion. But the thing is, the human mind wants to have a concise ending, something pretty. We even want this for our death. But it is never one conclusion. It's a muddle. It's a mix. My desire lies in the observation, not the observation of one thing, but the observation of all things. My desire lies in the preservation, the preservation of beautiful ideas, strange ideas to get a wider understanding of all the things that my mind is demanding. We are all unique because we are different. That is all that is the same. It doesn't matter what name, what gods you do or do not believe in, whether or not you believe it's all one big game. We are all the same in the fact that we are not the same. No matter how plain you feel, every part of you, not just one part of you, every part of you is unique. No matter how meek, no matter how weak, no matter how strong, no matter how wrong you feel, you are unique. 
saying all of this, learning all this, I feel crazy. And though I'm still young, I hope I've helped you learn. Or actually, I take that back. I hope you yearn. I hope you ask questions. I hope you find your maple, your uniqueness, your disruption. Saying all of this hurts my brain. I am so happy that I feel insane.